Right, so welcome everyone. This is our 50th episode of the Alliance Pentronic Seminar. And the honor goes to Dr. Stefano Benetti uh, from Stockholm University. We'll talk about inertial spin dynamics in ferromagnets today. Um, Dr. Benetti got his undergraduate degrees in Italy and Sweden and then um, a PhD from KTH, that's the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And after that, he moved to Stanford for a postdoc with uh, Joe Sturr and Hermann Dürer, uh, doing pioneering work in the field of uh, spin dynamics using unusual light sources, such as ultrafast X-rays and terahertz radiation. And then he moved back to Europe to continue research along those lines. And he's now Associate Professor of Physics um, at both Stockholm University and the Kafoskari University of Venice. So with this, I'll give it over to you, uh, Stefano, uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Kieran. And thank you for this uh, kind invitation in these uh, unusual times where we're trying to get, everyone's trying to get good in, <laughs> in broadcasting. I'm happy to be in this uh, amazing seminar series with lots of good speakers and uh, it's it's, a, it's incredible the way I got to fifty to fifty events already. Uh, so, and I hope I will be giving a good talk as good as the the, the speakers before me. And uh, today, so as you said uh, nicely, so the the main topic would be this inertial spin dynamics uh, in ferromagnets. It's the mostly result from from one work. Uh, but then I added in the end some other, uh, yet not published stuff, but some exciting work that we are trying to do at the uh, free, uh, free uh, electron lasers, where we try to um, to image uh, magnetism at ultra fast time scales. But uh, this I will talk a bit in the end. So now I'll focus in the on this topic and um, the the main. So this is let's see if it goes. Yes. So the main uh, um, drivers of this has been uh, has been my group and uh, the, the the PhD student close to me in the picture, Nidash, has been the, the, the let's say the lead author of, of this. And then also Nana and uh, the Banjan, who's now postdoc in, in Berkeley. All right. So before I go, I dig into this. So uh, I'll give you some motivation. This is something that uh, uh, we all need to do when we try to motivate, I mean, both ourselves and the framing agencies. But this is really something that I, I started actually honestly to think quite a lot, especially in these times when we stream a lot. And uh, it's not a mystery to, to us in science at least, but it's not as well known maybe to, general, to the general public that data is energy. And there is this nice figure that one of my students found, and it's pretty remarkable, that 300 Google searches is, is the equivalent energy of boiling one liter of water, which is, is quite a lot. It's something that uh, data with, doesn't feel like it has a mass, so it has it cost anything is actually has such such a such a high energy cost. And uh, what is clear also, although the numbers, um, I'm trying myself to do some 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 macro estimates. This kind of goes a bit all over the place, but the um, the amount of uh, data that we're producing and the uh, the, 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 the derivative, so the slope of, of this is so high that it is not going to be sustainable within one decade if this is the pace. So we need to do something, and uh, I think so. The, the uh, incremental development has been done on, on magnetic hard drives, which is where most of the of the data has been uh, has, is and has been stored for for, for since since many years back. So the idea is that can we go back to fundamental physics and trying to learn something that maybe will make things way more efficient than they are right now? Because most of the energy also on this right now goes into heat. So to, to cool down this, uh, this huge uh, data center, so in the picture what I show here is the Facebook server in north of Sweden. And um, so if we go back to the fundamental science, I think uh, there is, of course, this is the motivation to try to get to something, but there is also some very uh, interesting, I would say even fun, but uh, fundamentally interesting aspects in studying what I will talk about now, which is um, ultra fast uh, spin dynamics, ultra fast uh, physics. And the idea is that uh, thanks, thanks to this uh, large development of, of femtosecond lasers, there is now a, a way to deposit 
um, to have an instantaneous, very large light fields in a very short time. So the idea is that we're using uh, lasers, which are finely tuned to, to specific excitation of materials. You can actually not only understand and look at the materials, but start controlling matter with light. And the trick is this, that the energy you deposit is not that high, so your material doesn't melt, but, but the peak electric fields are huge. So you actually can change something uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a dramatic way. And uh, this sounds far-fetched, so like, yes, if you need a femtosecond lasers, then it's not very much uh, applications. But while I was preparing this talk and other talks, the, the smallest femtosecond lasers that, that exist right now, and it's actually quite powerful, is as big as a, as a, as a pen in, in the longest dimension. So this is something, of course, is not something that you can use like maybe in your laptop, but it's not something that really requires a huge optical table to work. So this is, the development is also going so fast that maybe we will not be, um, you know, the, we, we cannot predict what, what will happen in this regard. Okay, so, and uh, so this is the, um, the, the, the picture that a lot of people uh, show when they, they discuss ultrafast magnetism is the pioneering work by Jenny Bigot and um, in, in his group, which was done uh, almost 25 years ago. Uh, and it was the, the observation, experimental observation that if you take an ultra fast laser pulse in the visible range, you uh, shine it on a uh, thin nickel film in this case. And what, what they observed looking at the uh, magnetic optical response is the fact that the, the magnetization was quenched by 50% in less than a picosecond. So here, this was so much against the textbook uh, magnetism, which is the one described by the LLG equation, which is as time scales in the hundreds of picosecond or nanosecond. And a lot, of course, of interest for potential application when was the, the work that was done ten years later in the in the in the group of theorizing, where they showed that with ultra fast uh, pulses uh, with uh, different helicities, so where the the, you could control the, the direction of the circular polarization of light, you could actually not only demagnetize, but actually write magnetic information. The image that is on the top shows uh, um, material, in this case was, uh, was gadolinium iron cobalt, uh, is a ferromagnetic alloy with domains up and down, and you can see how light of opposite helicities can write uh, states which are opposite. So black is the magnitude point in, in the screen and white uh, out, so not polar in, in one direction or the other. And the, the one of the key concepts I will use tonight, so I, I, I think this is getting more and more, uh, you know, used in the, in the community, so maybe that's not necessary, but uh, if, if someone is not used to this, is the, uh, the idea of the pump probe uh, experiment, as I'm trying to say, is that the idea is how can we catch things that move at femtosecond timescales? And the, uh, the trick is the same trick that photographers use to do, um, uh, to catch the, 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 the wings of a, of a hummingbird. The, the, the issue with, with, the, with the wings of the hummingbird is that they move much faster than the, than the mechanical shutter of, of the camera. And in, in physics, we have the same problem, that the fastest shutter we have, or the fastest electronics is probably, well, I say a nanosecond, maybe it's a bit better, but it's always meant away from the femtosecond resolution that you need. So how do you do this? And the, the idea is the same. So what they do in the, in the, uh, for the hummingbird is that they put the hummingbird in a, in a dark room and then they turn the flash on for a very short time. And the camera, so the mechanical shutter may be slower, but the light comes only for the duration on the flash. So the, the film or whatever digital sensor is impressed only for the, for the time that the flash is on. And we do the same thing with materials. It's a bit more advanced. But the idea, we do the so-called pump probe experiment where we use a pump to trigger the motion of whatever uh, excitation we want to have in our material. So basically the start of the, of the wings flipping on the, uh, flapping on the, of the birds. And then we use a very short uh, laser uh, pulse that to, to basically look at our material instantaneously. Then we can have a very so, uh, slow detector, but the information that we collect comes only for a very short time. And we can now we can very accurately control the delay time between pump and probe. So we can do stroboscopic measurement where we follow the evolution of the, ma of the material uh, with great accuracy and in at this femtosecond and picosecond time scales. So this is what we call pump probe experiment. This is what we do in, in my lab. This is a, a, a version of a specific version of, of a pump probe experiment 
where the um, the uh, interesting thing is that the pump is is a bit of unusual a light source as uh, as, uh, as I was saying. So in this case, it's terahertz. So the, gener the 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 light that we generate it's a very long wavelength. So the photons are very very low energy, like three orders of magnitude lower than the visible light. The way you do it now, I will not go into too much either, But this is your uh, typically a tight stuff laser, 800 nanometer. Most of it goes into um, uh, into pumping another laser, which does um, a, a parametric down conversion to uh, go to shorter wavelength. And then there are some very uh, peculiar crystal which bring the uh, the wavelength from, let's say, two microns or one half micron down to the terahertz range, which is about um, 200 or 100 microns. Okay, and then you use special optics to focus on your sample, and then a, a, a tiny fraction of the light that is generated from your from your laser is, is used to probe. So these these things, since you start from the same laser, the two pulses are intrinsically synchronized, and by having a variable delay line, you can control it very very accurately. This is the way we do it. This is the lab source we use, and it's uh, kind of mo most of the spend we do it uh, here. And what we show um, a few years ago, uh, this is the, the experiment I already showed, is that you can actually get demagnetization and uh, of, of, of matter, of, of magnetic materials, so magnetic thin films with terrets as well. This is what we got. And uh, this is basically, uh, I'll show you in a moment, but basically demagnetization is this delta. Uh, so is this, sorry, is this drop of magnetization from the pre pump levels of the pre time zero level and after. So you go low. So you, you see a demagnetization as you could see with a near infrared laser like Geneve Bigot. But on top of it, the biggest thing that one it probably make you react is that you also have a, a coherent response to the magnetization. What this is, is the torque of the terrace electric field acting on the magnetization. And I will come back to this, but this is the key observation and the key difference between doing an experiment with, a, with an infrared pulse and with a terrace one. The coherent response in the Zeeman torque is actually something that you can measure uh, very easily and sometimes it's actually the biggest contribution. So uh, we also do a lot of experiments at big facilities. So the first three here, the European XFL, Fermi and LCLS, those are X-ray facility, uh, ultra, so free electron laser, uh, they produce X-rays of different wavelengths. And I will talk a bit about uh, one of them uh, in the end when I will talk about X-ray uh, experiments. But one of the facilities that we've been using as early users and we helped developing and uh, the, also the, the one that we used to, uh, in the work that we'll show tonight is the Stelbe. This is also like if you want uh, a free electron laser, but the, uh, it's actually a so-called super radiant source and the, and the radiation comes out is terahertz. So the type of radiation I just discussed. Um, so this is how it looks like, and the, um, the, uh, the, the idea is rather simple how this thing works. Uh, it's complicated technically, so it's a big accelerator, it can generate electrons, which are sent into what's uh, 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 called an ondulator, with, where there are uh, alternating magnetic poles. Basically, the electrons wiggle, and uh, uh, when they do, they create radiation, which is, uh, depending on the energy of the electrons and the spacing of the poles, in this case, in the terahertz range. And then the electrons are sent through, but the radiation is collected and sent to the, in this case, the lab that was upstairs. And what you get is relatively narrow band terahertz radiation, uh, which is tunable in the 0.1 to 1 point something terahertz. And where, what is constant here is the number of cycles, not the pulse duration. So if you tune the energy of the electrons, you get uh, different center frequencies, but basically what you get is something with a 10% bandwidth. And um, okay, so we use this, and we use this to do what? Uh, to study actually um, the uh, the response of the uh, of the of a magnetic material in a uh, in in a particularly different regime than the one that is typically described by the landau lifshitz gilbert equation. And this is also something that for this community is probably well known, but I'll just go through it uh, briefly. And the uh, the landau lifshitz gilbert equation tells you that uh, it basically describes and the, uh, the, the motion of the magnetization and it comprises two terms. The first one is uh, the, uh, the torque term, which is the, um, also uh, basically describes the precession of, of, of the magnetization under an, an, an effective field. When 
the two are not parallel. This is basically the, the, the term that gives rise to the Larmor precession that is depicted here. Then there is the second term, it's a damping term, the, uh, which basically tells you that, sure, the magnetization processes, but uh, because of the uh, interaction with the, with the sample and, and so on, at some point, the, uh, the magnetization will align with this effective field. And this is the equation that describes uh, both the precession, damped precession, but also when you go to, to the right of, uh, field values and, and geometries, the, is the way we describe switching. So the way we write information in all data centers in the, in the, in the world. So this is well known in the community, it's been studied, it works very well, but there is a problem. And that's not jump on me right away, but I, I'll try to provoke this with the title, but the allergy is actually wrong. And in, in which way? Uh, it's, it has an, an physical inertial tensor. And Gilbert, so the same Gilbert, which is the, 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 the G in the equation, noticed it in the review that he wrote in 2004. He wrote, I was unable to conceive a physical object with an inertial tensor of this kind. And the problem is that the inertial tensor looks uh, like this, if you assume the LLG equation. So it's, a, it's an inertial tensor with all zero elements except one. And uh, when I started to study uh, this, uh, this, this topic, I went back to physics 101 and I tried to remember what, how they, the tensor looked like. And the one with most zeros is the, uh, is the one of the rod rotating along its axis or also by, by an extreme. But basically there, there are all elements zero except two. But with all zeros except one, there is none. All right, so what, what's going on? And how can this be wrong if it's being used every day in data centers, for example? Well, this has to do with the approximations we do sometimes in physics, that if you have a system that where there are degrees of freedom which are separated in, by, a, by a lot, let's say, but several orders magnitude in uh, apart, so then you can sometimes make the approximation when you treat degrees of freedom separately. And so you can ignore some of the things which uh, the LG is, uh, in this case, the LG is, uh, is, is missing, but, but that's okay. So that's, that's why it works. But it means that there may be regimes where this doesn't work. And the, um, the way that this is, gets corrected is called the inertial uh, LG, which I guess is the, the sign of the times we kind of like to call the I LG. And uh, the, um, the, it was derived by, uh, in 2011 by Jeanette Gregro. And Iro derived the full equation with uh, using the Lagrangian formalism. So classical uh, physics uh, formalism. So you got the same equation, of course, you need to get to the same equation, but with one extra term, which is the second derivative. And basically what, how it looks like, it's, it's like this. And um, this was, uh, by the way, before I described terms, this was actually very nicely derived in, uh, in this uh, American Journal of Physics, where a lot of teachers actually publish this. And it's, it's, um, it's a very pedagogical way to, 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 to derive it. It's, uh, it's surprising that it was not done before, but, uh, but it can be followed. It's some uh, vectorial an uh, analysis, but, it, but it's pretty straightforward and it, sh it should have done before. It's a bit mysterious why people didn't do it before. Anyway, what, what happens when you do this derivation is that you add this term. So this is the same LLG equation I showed before, the precession, the damping, and now there is this thing with the, the second derivative. And what it does, this term, is that on top of this uh, damped precession that I showed before, it adds mutation on top of that. So this is what, what inertia gives you. And this is actually for a, for a normal mechanical object, anything that is in 3D needs to have this. It has to do with the conservation of angular momentum. And the, the new parameter that, that comes in when, uh, when you do this, when you introduce this term is tau, which is, uh, is defined here as the angular momentum of relaxation time. It's basically the time it takes for these uh, notations to, to relax. And basically you get back to the limit of the standard energy. Okay. And uh, so if you do the simulation, so what, if you, you solve this equation, what you get is that you get a very similar response, actually the same identical response as the, uh, as the LLG at low frequencies. This is the fMR resonance that you observe. But then there is a second peak that shows up uh, at a much higher frequency uh, where this is, at, at this point was unknown. This was just put there uh, because tau was not measured. So, but if you have a tau, depending on the tau, this peak moves. 
and it has a much higher frequency in general, and it is uh, also much, much smaller. And it, it's interesting. So the way this worked out, I think it was a pretty nice story. So in 2017, I was at the Ultrafast Magnetons Conference in, uh, in, uh, in Kaiserslautern. And uh, Generic uh, gave a fantastic talk on this. He showed his derivation, and I think everyone in the audience was, was impressed because he basically starts to tell us something about something that uh, we thought to know very well. And this, all of a sudden, he said, well, no, you missed something for all this time. And there was another thing that it was actually quite interesting. So sometimes coincidences uh, are, are, are good. That when I was a postdoc, we actually did measurements well, we use terahertz radiation uh, together with this measurement I show with SOD magnetization. It was a different sample, and there was some weird oscillation in the magnetic optical care effects at about 0.3 terahertz. I never explained this to myself. I had it in the back of my mind. But when he showed this and he said, well, this could be in the terahertz or whatever, we, we didn't know. Then I said, well, I may actually have seen something. So I showed the data and said, well, we need to investigate this more. And I remember Jean Yves Vigo was overhearing us. I said, Yeah, yeah, you should definitely go there and do this at the terrace. So we did. And uh, the, the, the lack also, I mean, we were not, I mean, other people tried also to find this. What, what we could do for the first time, it was to try to really do a force oscillator experiment like we do when we do FMR. So we go, well, we didn't know where this was. But uh, we, we go around the notation peak with an with a AC magnetic field. We drive it and try to look for a resonance. And the, the thing that we thought it was that since I saw something that was around this frequency, Telbe was just starting the operation. So there was a new machine that provided terrace fields which were, were not available until then. So, okay, let's write a proposal, try to get it, and, and, and let's do the experiment there. So we went there. And uh, yes, this is Telbe, what I showed before. This is the, the tunable range. So it was somehow covering the range where I saw this, this before. So it motivated this. And we went exactly to do what, what I just told you. And this is some details how we did it. So it's uh, um, just to show you that, uh, just give you a flavor how, I mean, that one has to really to be careful when you, when you do these things. But basically, we got this terrorist pulse coming up from the, um, from, from the accelerator. We focus it with these parabolic mirrors, the same that we use in my lab is the only way to focus uh, terrorist light. And then we have a femtosecond laser, which is synchronized with the, uh, with the, with the accelerator. So we, to, that we could use to probe. And basically what we did was a polar mock uh, measurement and I will show you the geometry in a moment. So this is how the uh, setup was, was looked like. So we come with a terrex field like this. This is, I'm showing the, uh, uh, sorry, the magnetic field component of the terrex uh, pulse. There is of course an electric field component orthogonal to it, which I didn't plot here. But the point is that we put H terrex perpendicular to the magnetization direction that we could set with, the, uh, with an external magnetic field. So we get H uh, and uh, M orthogonal to each other, and the propagation is orthogonal to both of them. So what we do is that we maximize the torque, the M cross H torque, and then we basically, with the probe, we, me we measure the uh, polar mode. So we measure the component of the magnetization, which oscillates out of plane. And to make sure that this worked, we did some, of course, we, we, we tried a few times before uh, to make sure everything is, is all right. Uh, and basically you can test kind of the selection rules of, of this and make sure that you're really measuring M cross H. And you can do this nicely by rotating the polarization of the terrace field. Here, when M and H are orthogonal, you get the maximum torque. We see a nice uh, oscillation, oscillating signal in the magnetic optical care effect response. We rotate the polarization of the terrace with a wave plate. This is very nicely uh, uh, under control. You see no response. You see basically uh, just the noise. Okay, so we knew that this, this we were doing a torque experiment, which is what we wanted to do. And then we tried this forced uh, Lorentz oscillator experiment. And uh, since uh, I will tell you, uh, I will tell you, uh, I will tell you later again. But the nice thing with this experiment is that. Uh, since your probe is much smaller than your pump, than the terrace fields, you can actually have information about both the amplitude and the phase of your response. So we're trying, and if you have, um, the, if you remember again, physics 101, if you go through a resonator, uh, you have an in-phase oscillation which is here before uh, the resonance, you get a 90 degrees out of phase, um, uh, or, or say uh, a 90 degrees shift uh, at resonance between driving force and your oscillation, and then you get 100 degrees out of phase after that. 
So we could look at both amplitude and phase. Okay, and uh, so this is what, what I showed you. So this is, I mean, I, I actually already shown you, but basically uh, the fact that we can resolve this, the, this is a, is a stroboscopic measurement over uh, millions of pulses. So this is all phase, nicely phase stable. Our probe pulse is uh, 50 femtoseconds. So it's basically like a delta in this, in this case. And here you can start to see something that, that was interesting. We saw it also immediately. You need to be to pay some attention to the normalization uh, because the, the fact that change in frequency you need to be careful and you need to normalize to the actual field that you get. But uh, we learn how to do it. But basically, you can see that at 0.4 terahertz there is some response. Uh, but if you go to 0.6 terahertz, this response increases and then it goes down again at 0.8 terahertz. So there seems to be something happening uh, around here, that kind of the response got bigger and then, and then smaller. So then we went looking at a phase and what I show here, uh, I show only two cases because the, the plot as you see is very crowded, but in the supplemental material of the paper, we have all the cases and you will see also uh, the, the, all the frequencies. But basically what you see here, so in green is this is a, the same trace I showed before, the, the, the measurement. Then what, uh, what this is, this is the driving force. This is actually uh, we measure. So this is the basically the uh, is the, is proportional. So we don't measure exactly the magnetic field, but we measure basically the electric field. But basically, this is the the terahertz field that we send to the sample. So what we call the driving force is actually the integral of the field. But but this is uh, a detail which is the actual driving force. And then with this input, we do the simulation and we see uh, what's uh, what uh, that it goes actually on the response goes on top of each other. But what you see also is that between the two frequencies at 0.4 terahertz, basically the driving force and the field are in phase within the error. But as you start to increase the frequency, there starts to be a phase slip, and this is about 90 degrees again within the error. We go to 0.8, and I think we also have data 0.9, it goes out of phase. Okay, so this is another so, so the amplitude and the and the phase. And if you put together all of the um, uh, of, of the this, you, you do a measurement of all these frequencies, and we actually checked three different samples uh, to see if this is, was uh, something that we could observe in all in all the cases. We actually see that there is the seem indeed to be a peak in in all cases. So we had actually three samples. One was cobalt iron boron, which actually has a resonant frequency, which seems uh, which shows a peak. Sorry, uh, at apparently slightly lower frequency than the permalloy. And this resonance that we observe is at 100 times, 1,000 times any known resonance in this material. And uh, there is also, as I said, slight shift between materials. We thought this could have something to do with crystal structure, but this we couldn't see any, any difference with, for example, uh, polycrystalline uh, permalloy and epitaxial permalloy. Maybe if you see here, the, po uh, the polycrystalline seems to have a slightly larger width than the, uh, than the epitaxial. So the, the point is that this was a very, I mean, each point here was six hours of continuous acquisition. And uh, I mean, the first time we saw it, we said, wow, this is exciting, but uh, I mean, we say, well, it could be anything. So we actually repeated this in three times over one year. So we get the in time three times then to, to make sure this was kind of reproducible. We of course went sampling the frequency at random. So this is, this peak is not some sort of drift to the machine It's something that you need to be very careful when you go at these facilities. But the, uh, this is a marvelous machine in terms of phase stability. So uh, we really got like the, the fact that we could do the analysis very efficiently on, on data, which was uh, very, very stable. And the signal is small. So this is a 250 kilos machine. So you get a lot of uh, uh, sampling. It's really, really like a, a, a tedious experiment to get there. Okay, so to give you some more details. Um, so the angular momentum extension time we got was about 10 picosecond which is good in the sense that it's a fast time for the typical switching that we care about. So LLG is okay, it's correct actually in the range that, that we usually use it, which is good, otherwise it would have been a bit problematic. And uh, also I will not go into this, I'm, I'm learning also this myself now, but it, there is also a fundamental reason why inertia should be there. And from a quantum mechanical point of view, um, there is, um, this arises from a higher order spinovic coupling in the in the in the Hamiltonian. When you include that, if you don't include it, that it doesn't come out. But if you include it, then you basically uh, get this uh, second derivative in this notation 
automatically. So in my not perfect language, I would say the spin always somehow gives the mass, so gives the inertia to the to the system. And there is also this is something that I was talking with Jean Eric about. This is the the fact that uh, if you have an oscillating uh, electro uh, ma magnetic dipole, the electrodynamics uh, uh, equations are not okay if you're not considering the, uh, the the inertia. So this has to be so the inertia description is actually more consistent from all out of. Uh, from several aspects uh, here. And uh, we now see now that we learn actually, we, we change uh, quite a lot, we tried a lot of samples and now we start to get how to see it. And we see it in the lab now is very uh, uh, ensuring now we don't need to go to this facility is actually we could get the actually much stronger signal even at very different frequencies. So this seems to be something that we start to understand how to, to see. Another thing that I thought was nice to, to say in the, um, <laughs> that, that is pretty interesting that the uh, ratio of the frequency between the magnetic notation and the precession is roughly the same as the ratio of the notation and the precession of Earth. And there is another Gilbert in history, which is the one that wrote the first treaty, uh, uh, the first book on, on, on magnetism, which is uh, called De Magnet in 1600. Uh, he thought that all the planets and, uh, and uh, yeah, all the planets were kept in orbit thanks to magnetic forces which of course was wrong, it was before Newton, but if you would have known that there was another coincidence, another anecdotal evidence that the notation and precession of the earth and of a magnet are related to each other, I think it would have been an, an interesting point, uh, a point in his favor, I would say. Anyway, so I thought it was a, a nice thing, um, but more, um, more um, interest, so more to the today's uh, issues, when, when do we care about this? Because we don't care about the clear notation, in uh, an inertia in normally when we switch magnetic field. But it could be an issue when we go, you start to reach the time scales of the, uh, that I tell you about 10 picosecond or less. And this was actually uh, already said, I think the best uh, picture I found on this was the paper by Kinel, by the paper was more than 10 years old. We actually saw this inertia driven spin switching in antiferromagnets. It's actually a pretty different thing having like a compensated without net M an hour. So this, in this case, our result is peculiar different, but I think the picture you use is very nice. So if you don't have inertia, your stimulus somehow, it needs to be as long as the time it takes to your particle, in this case, your magnetization to cross the, uh, the potential barrier. If you have inertia, you can imagine using shorter pulses where you just kick the, uh, uh, your particle, your magnetization, and you make it flip. In this case, is something that you can use at the at ultra fast uh, for ultra fast time scales or ultra fast switching. So this was actually like a teamwork. Uh, it, it got it took a lot of uh, a lot of time. Is a lot of people. It looks like almost uh, in these papers when you go to this facility it looks like a particle physicist experiment. But uh, so we had twenty authors. But I uh, I want to give credit to all of them. Uh, it was of course four from my my group uh, for the experiment analysis, but. It was really the new machine that we started to learn and to, to, to operate properly. And so there were eight people from, from the facility that were fundamental. You get 24 hours shift. You need to get a lot of fresh people to actually make things work. Uh, sample growers, characterizers, and, and theoreticians. So I think each, each of the authors here in this paper deserved and did a fantastic job to, to actually get us to these results. And this is kind of the, in the background, you see the, the fancy way of, of depicting this. And uh, I will switch gear. I mean, I will probably take 10 minutes more. I will not try. Um, I, I think I give the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the main talk now. Now it's kind of more relaxing, more overview what you can do. Something that I'm really excited about and is something very interesting. I think is something we are seeing a revolution now in, this, in these years in, in science is the advent of free electron lasers where we can combine in a, in a measurement we can try to reach the fundamental scales of, if you want, of the, micros of the microscopic world of quantum mechanics, which is the nanometer of at or atomic scale even, and uh, femto femtosecond scales. So this is another machine that we <laughs> start to operate uh, as early users, which is the European expand in Hamburg. So far, the only uh, superconducting FEL existing. Now LCLS2 is probably in Stanford is coming back. Uh, it's a very uh, impressive uh, machine. It's very it goes through two cities in Germany, and we try to do. Uh, I will maybe uh, give you just a, a very quick idea what does a free electron uh, laser does. But if you have some familiarity with the synchrotrons, synchrotron they create X-ray light by setting electrons in a, in a in a polygon actually, not in a circle. 
Uh, and uh, every time they're bent, they emit radiation. And the first uh, synchrotron actually operated in the, uh, really with bending magnets, that's so called. So just the dipole, you turn the magnet and you get uh, the light out. It was actually the first synchrotron we're using as a parasitic uh, use of something that was interesting for particle physics. So the, the development of synchrotron light source has been basically driven by this, by the, by this also called insertion devices. So the ondulators, so these magnets that get like um, more and more precisely aligned, uh, larger and so on. So they could create light that was more and more coherent. Uh, but the best coherence you get now, and uh, actually the best, the, the synchrotron with the best coherence is in uh, is in Sweden, or at least the, for the size there is also NLS2 in the US, but I think max four in Lund is slightly high coherence, is 10%. So it's still not fully coherent. And because this is not a, a laser, this is just, this is still like a light emitted in a, in a mostly incoherent way. So the big idea came in the, um, well, in the 90s, but it was then it became operated 10 years ago at Stanford. It was the LINAC that we used to discover uh, some of the quarks. And uh, basically the idea is that you bring the idea of a synchro to, to another level. So you take a lot, much longer LINAC, you accelerate the electrons at an even higher energy. And what you do when you do this is that you can compress them more. This is the first step. So in a free electron laser, you accelerate electron bunches to to hundreds or less femtosecond uh, uh, bunches of electrons that you can do because in a realistic, relativistic frame, the space charge problem becomes less severe. So you can compress it more simply because of the relative, um, yeah, or the relative uh, renormalization of space. And, uh, and the other thing is that you bring these ondulators, these insertion devices that, you know, improve in synchrotrons to make them like as long as I think 100 meters or, or so. And those are really the engineering marvel of this machine. So in San Francisco, they have a stuff we did on top of a, of a, of a, in a place where there are earthquakes. They, made, they managed to align uh, this ondulator for 100 meters with a micrometer precision. And this allows to create something which is called the self-amplified spontaneous emission. So you get, you start from a random bunch of electrons, you start to make them oscillate so nicely ordered that at some point they basically go at the same speed as the as the as the light that they emit as they go, and then they start to get in phase and in tune. So the light make the electron bunch to order in 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 sheets, and this is called uh, micro bunching, and um, and this is basically the the, the idea of a so called SASE self amplified spontaneous emission. And the idea was independently developed by Mady, John Mady, Evgeny Saldin, and Claudio Pellegrini. And the the jump of of brilliance, which is one measure you, you, you one way you can measure the um, how how intense a light source is, uh, it was by compared to the to the best synchrotrons by knowing an orders of magnitude jump. And I don't I forgot who said it, but basically the chances of getting Nobel Prize correlate directly with the jump in a logarithmic plot. Plot. So this is um, is really like a, a revolution in in X-ray science. So why do I care about these, um, <laughs> these machines? Because the idea was to try, so this is what we wanted to do, try to image the smallest possible magnetic object you can have uh, when it reverses and at the fastest possible time scales. So this, the smallest possible object is a skirmium. And the idea was to do uh, holographic magnetic imaging, pump probe, so time to solve. So the idea was to reset the thing every time and see basically while if even it reverses with a with a time uh, with a with a femtosecond fast this curve, to try the idea to try the smallest possible magnetic bit. How does this work? The holography is, is a pretty fascinating uh, thing. You can show also to your students uh, in uh, most of many physics lab have this. But basically, it solves a fundamental problem in a very clever way. So if you take the the uh, the Stockholm University logo, you take the Fourier transform, or the, you take the diffract what would be the uh, if you shine light through this, this would be the diffraction. You try to take the Fourier transform again, you don't get the log again. And this is the reason that you don't, you lose, when you measure the, the amplitude and all, you lose the phase. This is the phase problem. And Gabor in, 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 in 48 solved it in a very clever way. He, he, he converted the phase a problem in an amplitude problem. You take two beams and he makes them interfere. Okay, and the interference fringes as the phase information. 
And this is how it works. So you take the object, in this case, the logo of, of Stockholm University with a reference aperture. You send the same uh, the same light, so the light which is, come, is coherent light or light from the same source, you go through it, you get uh, whatever. If you do a diffraction experiment, you get the diffraction pattern, which is the FFT. And uh, what you get is, this is the math um, behind. So you get the autocorrelation terms, which is which are related to the to the square of the amplitude. This is the one that doesn't have the phase information, but you also get cross correlation terms. And here the phase is present. So if you now do the, FF, the inverse FFT, what you get is two images, two twins. So these are the two the two terms uh, on opposite side of the autocorrelation uh, image. And this was done was shown to work for magnetic imaging by uh, Stefan Eisebit. And this is how they did it at a synchrotron. But the nice idea, so the, the FEL, the free electron noise were coming. So the nice thing of this method, you don't require any lengths to do this. So that's why, and this very intense uh, X-ray burst may burn any optics in the way. So this was the, they were developed with the idea of being used as a free electron laser. And this is exactly what, what you get. So the, what it showed before is so you get autocorrelation with this basically well there is something but it's saturated and then you get two copies of the magnetic domain in this case this is what we did we want to see at the scramians we haven't got there yet but it was really a major effort to get this first superconducting machine to work and after a lot of effort this everything was new everything the software the detectors the machine uh, so basically what we got this is the scattering you get from uh, in this case we will look at domain samples uh, from one elicity uh, so you, you go to, to try to do this imaging go with left and right circular polarized light and the uh, the sum is the so-called charge scattering and the difference is the magnetic scattering so what you see here is this difference of two beam with opposite elicities and basically this is this thing that you see here is all magnetic information now if you take the inverse Fourier transform of this what you get is something very complicated which has to do with the detectors but if you have a lot of patience and you look into this, you see there is something interesting there. And this is basically the domain structure of the uh, of, of the film. And this is exciting because this was done in a reasonably short time with 50 femtosecond pulses. And to show you the difference, I mean, of course, in a synchrotron, you have a much more stable light source, uh, but uh, and you could do something very similar. So this is basically now the SNR is a bit better here, but the pulses are a thousand times longer. So this is a very beautiful image, so you can get very nice domain and so on. But this allows to do femtosecond uh, experiments that you cannot do here. So this, the hope now is that we actually start to get those. So we, we have, so the, the, the amount of data generated, this superconducting FEL is insane. I think this experiment was about 600 terabytes that we got out. So the, <laughs> going through data is not a trivial task, but, but we are getting there. All right, so I think I'm just short of the 45 minutes, which I, think was was the goal so if you want to take home three messages so the first i hope i convince you that we can now see uh, evidence for inertial spin dynamics in ferromagnets uh, in the form of a notation uh, with a related uh, angular, angular momentum relaxation time of the order of 10 picoseconds uh, i also showed you that uh, now with this new machines you can do pump probe magnetic stereography and the idea, this is what, what I really would like to do, is to study ultrafast dynamics, such as the inertial dynamics at this machine. So try to also combine the terahertz and the X-ray. So we drive this thing and we try to see, to learn also how this, um, the, the, the spatial extent of, of, of this excitation, how to behave in, not only in time, but also in space. And the goal is basically, really, this is what we're trying to push that Hopefully not in a, in a long time, not far from now. In principle, everything is already there. We can get to the 10 nano and to the 10 femto resolution, 10 nanometer and 10 femtosecond. And with this, I think I'm at 45. And I'll thank you for, for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to take them. Thank you very much, Stefano, for this very interesting talk. Um, so we can now take uh, questions. If you're in Zoom, please uh, use the raise hand feature. If you're watching on Twitch, just type your question in the chat box and um, I'll read it for you. Uh, so the first question, uh, Sergey, please go ahead. Hey, Stefana. Nice uh, thanks, nice for the, 
thanks for a very nice well you don't see me yet but okay no uh, i don't see you very... but i still hear you <laughs> okay see I'm, you I'm i'm on the i'm at the beach but uh, in any case uh thanks for a very nice talk and i had a question for you so my understanding is that you know ultimately this uh mutation dynamics is related to spin orbit interaction that's something that you mentioned also so then one would naturally expect that for example depending on the uh the strength of the interaction or the g factor you would see some kind of variations with that. Have you kind of tried to explore the correlation between spin, you know, the known spin orbit effects and, uh, and the mutation frequency? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Sergey. You really exactly got it. So what we did it, uh, so the experiment we did, we, we, we took uh, a, a, a cobalt, uh, growing epitaxial in different ways. And uh, there, the, the different way you grow it actually gives, uh, which has a pretty strong anisotropy, moves the frequency by quite a lot. So, and the idea was, I mean, that's the samples that we happen to have, and but we are, the idea is basically, I think what you want to try is to really uh, increase the spin orbit coupling and see how it affects. And it seems to increase the frequency and also the, the amplitude. So what we saw, it seems to be a, a so higher frequency, higher amplitude, and also uh, smaller line width. So I don't know if this was also the, the, the type of samples, but there seems to be a correlation. I think it's a matter also of proper, I think you, you know this well, but being able to grow nice materials and study them systematically. But there seems to be. Uh, I, I can tell you, so we did it on HCP and FCC cobalt, and we see a difference. Uh, this is the only data. So the other thing we wanted to try, of course, something with platinum, something even, even larger. Iron platinum and so on. So try to see if it's there. The thing, of course, you start to get, you know, iron platinum, but then you may need a lot of a, a few Tesla to saturate it so it can get complicated. So it's but it's there. I think now that we we learn this trick and I think we know where to look, it's uh, yeah, you, you, we can start explore. But you're completely right with the intuition. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Stephen Bennett, please go ahead. Hi, Stefano. It's uh, Steve Bennett, uh, U.S. Naval Hi. Research Laboratory. Um, so question uh, for the uh, holography, how thick are the magnetic films uh, on, the, on the nitride membrane? And a follow-up, I'm wondering what the benefit is over techniques such as XPEAM for, for imaging uh, magnetic domains as synchrotrons. Yes, very good question. So the uh, I don't have the exact things, thickness on top of my head, but it's about. So the co I, I mean, what matters is the, is the thickness of the material of the edge that you're looking at. So I think we had we were looking at iron, and it was seven nanometer of iron, something like this. Uh, it, it was less than ten, I think. Um, I'm pretty sure it's less than ten. I forgot if it was more towards five or more towards ten. So that's that's the first. Okay. And uh, the other is, well, that's the, I mean, well, the two things, I think, if you say PIM, there are two things. First, we do photon in, photon out. So if you want to study things with magnetic fields, which are pretty intense with the PIM, you don't have. But the other thing is that the PIM is a synchrotron, you have 50 picosecond pulses. So the imaging, if you want that PIM is better, but uh, it comes to with two big drawbacks, no magnetic fields. And this, if you do it a synchrotron, it's, um, it's not co compatible with ultrafast. And we want to see this femtosecond or like ultrafast response. Ah, okay, yeah. So that's, that's, that's the thing. It's really like, uh, maybe I, I should stress more, it's the ultrafast thing. But if you don't care about that, uh, I have to say, so I don't think FEL would replace synchrotrons because synchrotrons are much better in terms of stability and everything else. But if you need to go fast, uh, you pay something uh, with that to get to the other, to the other thing. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Branislav, please uh, go ahead with a question. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for the very insightful talk. So you mentioned this uh, fundamental um, physical reasons uh, for the uh, presence of this magnetic inertia term. And it looks like that all of your arguments uh, require non-zero spin orbit coupling. But so uh, there are a couple of uh, kind of uh, rigorous uh, theoretical studies where we, um, my group and some other people like Michael Potokhov, 
what we do, we actually uh, take the uh, LRG equation and then we couple the equation directly to time-dependent quantum electrons. Mm -hmm. And we kind of feed electrons okay. back into micromagnetics where it is not... Uh, mm -hmm. standard codes do not have any electrons. Right, right, right. And mm -hmm. yeah, and what happens in that case is that even without any spin orbit coupling, you end up with a kind of complicated non-Markovian uh, LRG equation, mm -hmm. which has a memory kernel and mm -hmm. time retardation effects. And now okay. I can argue, you know, this doesn't look realistic because electron spin is always uh, much faster than any of these localized spins, and we could probably get rid of the kernel. And indeed, one can actually expand that kernel in a power series in delta M. And if you stop expansion at order delta, second order in uh, M, mm -hmm. you exactly uh, recover the inertia term. Oh, interesting. The, only, the only difference between that kind of quantum classical derivation and the one, let's say, the Grove did would be that uh, the prefactor of that inertia term actually cannot be made in general a constant. It mm -hmm. remains time dependent. So it looks like you would be getting like a LRG equation is look like dm over dt equals minus mm -hmm. gamma m cross h effective plus the Gilbert term plus the inertia term and that inertia term as well as Gilbert term are multiplied by a, mm -hmm. by a Gilbert dumping constant or the inertia uh, mm -hmm. you know, strength, which actually are time dependent, mm -hmm. not, not parameters that are like right. sort of just, uh, you know, constant you get from somewhere. Yeah, 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 sure. And basically what this suggests is that you could, you could have two origins of either dumping or uh, inertia. Like one would come from standard spin orbit coupling when you would run some DFT calculations and get these constants. But then there is another one that would come from this uh, effect that electrons can never, essentially the fundamental physical reasons for all of this stuff is that electron can never instantaneously follow magnetic moment. Mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. If that is possible, you would call that some adiabatic dynamics, but even then there is always an angle between right. yeah, yeah. electronic spin and magnetic moment. Yeah. And that angle means torque. And torque yeah. means, you know, either dumping yeah. or anti-dumping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And That's so now the question, of course, is like, you know, how would one experimentally prove that, yes. you know. That was my yeah. question to you. No, I think you need, I mean, why would we need to try to calculate the observables in the two cases? Since mm -hmm. we have information, if it's a time dependent thing, I mean, uh, I think honestly, this measurement we done with me, we didn't know. So this is not the cleanest data. So the new, if you look, go and prepare your sample to try to maximize this. Well, we're thinking, I didn't know about this. So I'll try, if you can send me the reference, it would be interesting. Yeah, I'll, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll prepare an email. Yeah, I will just start typing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Kind it would of, be uh, nice to see if there is a way to say, okay, let's do an experiment and we can try to see what, you know, if we can predict the difference and try to see. Uh, what I know that it is um, second order spin, I think there was a paper from Peter Oppenheimer from Uppsala where he did the derivation of the Hamiltonian and then he got yeah. to this. I think yeah, he's second one of the people who has been playing with this. There are some people who have been writing this uh, uh, LLG equations with yeah. time retardation, but they would kind of again try to do them phenomenologically. Well, if you write and couple directly to quantum dynamics, then all of this stuff comes out automatically. So it is quantum mechanics which fixes all yeah. of these terms and this time dependency and so on. And by the way, we did actually try to run this calculation on, let's say, two magnetic domain walls uh, annihilating each other, which is experiment the uh, Beach Lab published in yeah. uh, uh, Nature Physics, a very nice experiment of both fundamental physical interest and uh, applications, because it eventually, when you annihilate two magnetic domain walls, you shoot out the short wavelength spin wave. And what we found in that case is that this effect I'm talking about is about two times bigger dumping and inertia, mm -hmm. if you want, than anything that would come up by you putting a standard 0 0.1 uh, or 001 LLG uh, mm -hmm. that people do when they do micromagnetics. Because Beach actually does explain his experiment with micromagnetics, but some okay. elements of that, like what is missing is pumping, electrons moving, because once this is moving, the magnetic moments, they're going to drive these electrons in all directions yeah. as a pumping current. And that yeah. pumping current has to have effect back on the magnetic moments. And you don't have that effect in 
a standard micromagnetic, so you know, treating yeah. this yeah, yeah, yeah. constant. Or in any case, thanks a lot yeah, for no. the talk, and I'll send you this. No, token. thanks. It's interesting because I think we know so little, so it's good to to try to explore this, and if there is a way to. <laughs> to learn well, it's great to know that this inertia is there, you know, because when I published this it paper in 2018, people say, well, this thing is, the whole theory is useless because inertia doesn't exist. So if your <laughs> well, it should, theory... It's actually, it seems clear it should be there. Yeah, mm -hmm. if your theory predicts inertia and we have never seen it, then the theory must be wrong or yeah, 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 useless. Sure. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other further questions? either on Twitch or on Zoom. Doesn't look like it. So let's uh, thank uh, Dr. Benetti again. Uh, this was a very interesting talk. Thank you.